and good evening. I thank you for making a choice to come out this evening. And those who are online watching, I invite you, I thank you for, for tuning in. And tonight we're going to talk about, um, I guess the first step of the seminar is intentional faith. And why do we need intentional faith? What is the purpose of it? You see, a lot of us say we have faith. And that's a great thing. But if our faith is tested and it fails, what good is that? If your faith fails you, then you have essentially no use for your faith. So through these next few studies, I am, I am wanting to give you some foundation for your faith. I, I, I want to encourage you, not through just feelings or emotions, but instead through authenticity, through proof, through an intelligent faith, if you would have to say it. Amen? And so with this, we're going to use the Bible, of course, as our foundation, but we're going to use our own history books. We're going to use our own science books. We're going to research archaeology, and we're going to find that this, this Bible is being proved through science, proved through history, and proved through archaeology. Some youth actually, they ask me some of the most difficult questions. And it shows me if these youth have the questions to want to ask the Bible, then maybe more than just children want to know the answers. So if anybody asks you this hard question like, who actually is the devil? What does he look like? What, what was Jesus saying at this point or that point? Can I really depend on an ancient book that was written 2,000 years ago? Is it relevant today? These kind of questions we're, we're going to address, and, and many more. And the further we get into, the more your faith is going to develop. The more your faith is going to develop, the more a person will be able to test you, and you'll be able to stand your ground, and your faith will remain certain. Now, let me give a, a very quick illustration, example, so to say. Um, if you are questioned about some principle in your life, and you really are just trying to make excuses for that principle, then you usually become argumentative in your reply. You, you get defensive, so to say, and, 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 you, and you throw up a, a large wall so that nobody can challenge what your principle is. But if you have a rational understanding of what that principle is, if you're doing it for a, an actual purpose, then you can explain rationally why you do what you do. And so this is the same way we're going to tackle faith. We're going to understand exactly what the Bible says and why. And we're going to address the top questions that many people have in our day and age. If our youth have it, I guarantee we're going to have it. And so before we begin, I want to say one more quick word because I don't dare open this book otherwise, if you don't mind. Lord, be with me. Allow me not to speak my words, but your words only. Be with each person here and those who are watching. Open our ears, open our eyes, open our minds, and allow us to gain an understanding that, comes, that brings us closer to you. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Amen. All right. So be, now we're going to begin. In our current society, can you say that we can predict what's going to happen tomorrow? Are you able to tell me what the weather will be like tomorrow? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, we watched the weather channel, right? Amen. So, but when we look in the far future, like a years ahead, can you give me what will happen to Florida next year, January 5th? Can you tell me? Absolutely not. It would be, it would be absurd if I expected a, a valid answer from you. And I, I really, I'm not going to lie to you, uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, we're going to be watched by Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I could not predict that he was going to become mayor of California. Could you predict that before it happened? And, and I'm not sure if Donald Trump is watching, but certainly I could tell you I never thought I would see the day where he would run for office, let alone get the presidential seat. Now, I got no issues with either ones. I don't really damper in politics too much. I just could not see it coming. I could not see it coming. I, I'm not a great predictor. And so 
as a young man, I always wanted to know the inside curve. I always wanted to know what was going to happen next. I want to know who I should love. I want to know what kind of car I should buy. I want to know what kind of job I should get, what kind of school I should go to. So I wasn't wasting my time, right? If you can know what the future brought, then your time's not wasted because you can go right in the correct directions. That makes perfect sense. And so we make these decisions like, I wonder what I should do because we are uncertain. I kind of like certainty in my life. In fact, I really love certainty in my life. Many people find certainty by going to a fortune teller who invests their money in crystal balls. They, they, they invest their money in, in psychics and visions and astrologers. And, and they think that these people have some kind of truth that they can tell us. Um, we also have those horoscopes. There's like 3,000 different papers with 3,000 different horoscopes. Right? And so with this being said, I went, to, I went to a restaurant with my wife last week. And it's my favorite restaurant. Asian restaurant over in Austin. We went to go visit some family down there. And after the uh, food, we got uh, our fortune cookies, right? Now, as I'm cracking up my fortune cookie, I read the fortune, which means future, inside on a small piece of paper. You got the lucky numbers on one side. You got your fortune on the other. And my fortune said, this year you'll find a new romance. I look next to my wife, and now I'm going to explain for the next five to ten minutes, this is not telling you the truth. This, this, this is, I am very satisfied with my current romance. I, I, got no, I have no need to, to, to upgrade or, or, or to re-up. No, I'm very satisfied with, with the woman that I have in my life. She's been very, very good to me. I would, I would have nobody else. But after a few minutes of explaining, I was able to, to, to call that little piece of paper false, right? Well, there's a man who is one of the greatest predictors. He is, he is world-renowned, not just in this, not in this generation, but in all generations that preceded him. His name is Nostradamus. Nostradamus. And this man has set the record at the greatest prediction. Do you know what his predictive rate is at? At the maximum, 10%. Which means 90% of the time, what? 90% of the time he's incorrect. I don't know if I want to stake my life on a man who's incorrect nine-tenths out of the time. That doesn't seem very wise to me. I, I, I need somebody who is a little more accurate. If I'm going to invest myself in somebody, I want better odds, if, as a gambler might say. In, in the Bible, we can turn to Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10, or write it down if you want to jot it. I have the scriptures on the screen for you for the most part. Sometimes I might not. But the Word of God says, for I am who? I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. From what? From the very end to the very beginning. Does that make sense? From the ancient times that things are not yet done. Again, he says in John chapter 14, verse 29, And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, what? The purpose he does it is not for a fancy, like a, oh, ah, ta-da. No, he's not doing a magic show with us. He's saying, I'm doing this because I want you to believe. I just want you to believe. I, I don't want you to be amazed. I don't want you to go, oh, wow. I want you to do one thing. I want you to believe in what I've written in this book. And so that's what we're going to study tonight is this, this prophecy ability and we're going to go to a story that's near and dear to my heart. It, it's, it's an amazing story. It's, it's short, but it's so powerful. It's so powerful that God will be able to reach in the past and with theft accuracy, not 10%, not 20%, not 30%, but with 100% accuracy, be able to sketch out a timeline. A what? A timeline through the ages. Are you ready? It begins in Babylon. Huge, huge city. Anybody here at the Hanging Gardens? 
It's one of the seven wonders of the world. It came from Babylon, right? Now, Babylon, back in its age of, of glory, was one of the greatest kingdoms ever known. It had gold lying in the streets. There was gold on all the statues. There was gold in the money. There was no poverty. They had a river running through their city. They had enough rations to last them decades. They were not wanting. Babylon was one of the greatest nations, one of the most wealthy nations, even to this day. When they were trying to pillage it, it took them decades to pillage all the gold out of Babylon. That's how wealthy that country was. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of that country at the time we're talking about. About 6th century BC is where I'm at. And he lays eyes, he lays his eyes upon Jerusalem. And the reason being is Jerusalem is the only other kingdom that is in a path of him establishing a world dominating empire. So once he gets rid of Jerusalem, guess what? He owns the world. The known world is his. All right? Now, he couldn't do it initially. In fact, it took three different attacks, three different waves, three different sieges, and then eventually Jerusalem fell. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was not a... I don't want to use the word... He, he, he had great tactics. He was very smart. In fact, is whenever he conquered a nation, he did not wipe out that nation. Instead, he found their smartest. He found their most trained. And then he assimilated them into his nation. He repurposed them for what he needed them for. Does that make sense? We do that a lot of times in this day and age. It's, called, it's really great business. When, it, when like uh, Kmart and Sears, they merged did they fire everybody from Kmart or fire everybody from Sears? Absolutely not. No, what they did was they just retrained all the employees that were valid, that were valuable, that had the great marks on their records. All the bosses stayed around. The best workers stayed around. Those who wanted to stay around stayed around. But you had to be retrained. Well, this is kind of like a repossession of a business, so to say. Jerusalem got taken. And so then Nebuchadnezzar goes in, takes all the wise men, all the leaders, and he, he brings them in and puts them through Babylonian school, so to say. And so then he begins giving them Babylonian names. He changes their name. He gives them Babylonian clothes. And he lets them play Babylonian games. Eventually, if you speak like a Babylonian, if you dress like a Babylonian, if you act like a Babylonian, what are you going to be? You're going to be Babylonian, right? When we come to America, when we start speaking American, when we start dressing like American, when we start playing American games, guess what? I, I don't care if you're from another country, you're American. You're American. That's all there is to it. So that's the way that King Nebuchadnezzar ran business. So he sets these people up. Um, one of the young men that he captured was called Daniel. He is the one that wrote the book. He's one of the same. And so in Daniel chapter 2, we're going to start from verse 1. It says, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that the sleep left him. Then he gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. Now, this was not abnormal. A lot of times when the king had a nightmare, when the king was uncertain, when the king had a bad vibe or a bad feeling, he would call all his magicians in, and they would interpret his dream. They would interpret his feelings. They would say, oh, you were dreaming of, of, of a cow next to a river with a tree beside it. What this means is that your kingdom is going to prosper. It's going to do great. Oh, king, oh, king, live forever. And then they go back to bed. That's status quo. That's how it usually went at nighttime when the king woke up with a nightmare. But this was a little bit different, as we're going to find out really soon. And verse 3 says, And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dreams. Now, if you have your Bibles, I challenge you to follow me. Do not allow me to deceive you. Do not allow me to pull the wool over your eyes. I am reading from the New King James Version, but you'll be reading from the King James Version if you've got your Bible that you got from the front or from the pew. So the wording might be a little bit different, but not too much. And so I have had a dream, in verse 3 he says, 
and my spirit is anxious to know the dreams. Then the Chaldeans did as they always did. They spoke in the king in Aramaic, saying, O king, live forever. Tell your servant a dream, and we will give you the interpretation that will make you go to bed, that will allow you to sleep, that will allow you to leave us alone, that will allow you to pay us. Just, just, just tell us your dream so we get this over with, O king. I'll make you feel better. Just tell me what your, your dream was about. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, then what? You shall be cut in pieces, and your house shall be made an ash heap, which means just totally destroyed. That's the bad news. But he goes, No, no, no. But however, I'm, I'm a great king. I'm a wealthy king. However, if you tell me the dream and its interpretation, if you do your job, if you do your job, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, just tell me the dream and its interpretation, and you guys can go back to bed. It's that easy, right? So what's the two things the king wants? He wants the dream, and he wants its interpretation. Is that clear? The two things he's asking for. They answered again, the Chaldeans, the magicians, the soothsayers, the astrologers. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servant the dream, and we will give its interpretation. They're still not listening, are they? They've heard, but it didn't sink in. It didn't register. The king answered and said, I know for certain, I'm no dummy, that you're trying to gain time because you see that my decision is firm, that you see my decision is solid. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you, that for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream. Tell it to me. And if you could tell me the dream, I shall know that you can give me what? The interpretation of the dream, right? The Chaldeans, they're in the corner now. He, he explicitly stated, he says, the Chaldeans answered the king, he says, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, no lord, no ruler has ever said such things or tried such things with any magician, astrologer, or Ch Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell the king except who? Except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. Therefore, for this reason, the king was angry and furious. Now, what was his decree? He said, tell me the dream or else what will happen to you? I'm going to cut them into pieces and turn their houses into ash heap, right? Verse 13, so the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Why? Why was he after Daniel? He went to Babylonian school, right? He was one of the wise men that came out of Jerusalem. And so, in fact, if you, if you read chapter 1 of Daniel, which I encourage you to do tonight if you don't have, if you've never read it, he comes out being one of the smartest, if not the smartest, out of Jerusalem and in all Babylon. So yeah, they're after him. They're coming to kill him. And so Ariok comes knocking on his door. Captain of the guard. Translation. The best killer Babylon as a world empire has to offer. This is the king's guard. He knows how to do his job. I'm betting he does. The king will have no slouch for a guard, will he? No, he's going to have the best of the best. And so here comes the best of the best, the killer of killers of Babylon, knocking on Daniel's door. And Daniel opens up the door. He says, oh, how can I help you? Sorry, Daniel, i got to kill you. Got to happen. Well, 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 hold on. Now, I'm sure if he got on his knees and started pleading, no, 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 don't, it was, Shh, that would have been it. But Daniel acts with wisdom and intelligence. He says, what's the matter? Why is it so urgent to go out killing all the wise men? All this money wasted for all this training. Why would a king want to do such a thing? It makes no logical sense. Tell me what's going on. Maybe, maybe I can help out somehow. And so surely... Ariok takes the time. He takes the time to tell the, the, the Daniel the matter. Verse 19. So what does Daniel do? He goes in. Where does he go into? 
He goes into the throne room of the king. He goes in there. He says, give me time. Then the Chaldeans, then the magicians, then the soothsayers one time. What's different from Daniel than these magicians, astrologers, and soothsayers? He had confidence. He had great confidence. He, he wasn't going there begging, pleading, trying to deceive. He said, no, no, I will give you the interpretation. Just give me a little, just give me a little time. And then he would do what any good person would do in his situation. He would begin praying. Amen. And this, and this prayer comes up and, and, and he's talking to, to his three companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And, and, and all of a sudden, in a vision, they get this reveal. They get this understanding of what the king needed. Verse 19 says, then the secret was revealed, Daniel chapter 2, verse 19. The secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel did what? He blessed the God of heaven. Let me tell you some truth here. If you sincerely ask God, if you sincerely pray to God, he will answer you. Now, it might not be by audible voice. It might be by divine appointment. It might even be by you getting sick. It might be by some mere, what you would consider a coincidence, but it's called his divine plan. He will answer. Now, when he answers, that right here so shows what we should do. We should say, thank you, right? When we ask our father for an expensive gift and he gives it to us, do we, do we say, well, maybe nowadays a little bit we do, but back in the day, when we got a gift, we're like, thanks, right? And so we should with God. It's no mystery. Makes logical sense. And so in verse 19, chapter 2, going to verse 20, it says, Daniel answered and says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And his changes and, and times and the seasons, he removes kings and raises up kings. A beautiful prayer. He gives wisdom to the wise. He acknowledges those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells in him. I thank you and I praise you, O God of my fathers, for you have given me wisdom and might and now made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Very next thing he does, totally against the grain. Every single person is running away from the greatest killer that Babylon has ever known. The, the wise men, the Chaldeans, because they're smart, they're running as fast as they can. They're using all the back roads so they don't, so they don't get cut to pieces, right? Because Arioch's on, on a warpath. And while every other person is running away from Arioch, what's Daniel doing? Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king has appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king. And I will tell the king his interpretation. Now, Arioch is a very smart guard. And he didn't get the position captain of guard for no reason whatsoever. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel, verse 25, before the king and said thus to him, what? I found somebody for you that can tell you your intent. I found him. He, this is the guy. He can tell you your interpretation. I found a man of the captains of Judah who will make known to the king, what? The interpretation. If he can make known the interpretation, surely he has the, the dream, right? Makes perfect sense. Then the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar in Babylonian. He says, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Verse 27. And then in the presence of the king, he said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, cannot be declared to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be when? In the latter days. That word latter days means in the last days, at the very end of time, so to say. So he's saying in a distant future. And then he goes through this dream. He says, he says, your dream. 
The visions on your head were these. As for you, O king, the thoughts came to you in your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this, deep in the future. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than any other one living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation of the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Question, can you right now Honestly, if I could tell you the thoughts of your heart, would you want to know? Would you really want to know? But here we have a captive, a, a slave, a prisoner, the lowest of the lowest of Jerusalem, immigrant, and the greatest capital that has ever existed, the, the richest kingdom of its kind. And here he is in, in the king's chamber, and he says, I'm going to tell you the thoughts of your heart. Now keep in mind, friends, all the king had to do was lower his scepter and Daniel would have ceased to exist moments later. Ceased. His guards would have, would have killed him before he could make a move. It would be instantaneous. Verse 31, You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and his form was awesome. It was awesome. This image's head was made of fine gold, its chest and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet of partly iron and partly clay. And here we go right here, the head of gold, chest of silver, Belly of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. Right? You watched while a stone was cut out without man's hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff. Now, I'm not sure if anybody knows what chaff is. It's the, it's the flakes from like wheat. It's like, it's like, paper thin small shreds it's like ashes and so these these are these are small pieces of material that are on the threshing floor during the summer and then the wind carries them away so that no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth now i'm not sure if you ever had a dream you could not remember. I'm not sure if you had that or not. But when this king had this, this, this image, as soon as Daniel started explaining it, he was like, that's right. The, the, the head of gold was there. That, 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 that's, that's right. The chest of silver. And as he unfolded the king's forgotten memories, the king got more and more confident of what Daniel was saying. By the end of this, the king had to be on the edge of his throne, wanting to know the next thing he was going to say. He not only recalled his dream, he called it with precise accuracy. With precise accuracy. The very next sentence, I, I think it must have a misprint in it. It says, this is the dream. Very confident, right? This is the dream. What was the, what was the king wanting again? He was wanting the dream and um, the interpretation of the dream. Now, we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. And I'm guessing that my Bible has a typo in it. Because if I'm not mistaken, Daniel was there by himself. Yep. Daniel was the only one that was speaking. Was the captain of the guard? giving the interpretation of the dream? Were the soldiers that were guarding the king giving interpretation of the dream? Was the king himself conversing and talking to himself about what the dream was about? No, no, no. Only one person is next to Daniel here, and that's God. When we pray to God, when we pray that he will help us, he will stand next to us. But Daniel here is acknowledging it. Here he said, 
I cannot tell you the dream. There is no one on earth who can give you the dream, only the God in heaven who reveals secret things. And here he's backing it up. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For God of heaven has given you a kingdom, a power, a strength, and glory. And wherever the children of man dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand. And he has made you what? He has made you a ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. And I, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that the king was okay with that. I, I, I'm pretty sure he wasn't arguing that he was a, the head of gold. First, the head is the very top. And, and gold is a, a precious metal, right? And that, that, just, that just adds to his whole empire of gold. He says, yeah, that's right. I'm the head. And man, I'm made of gold. He loved it. So question. You are this head of gold. He's talking to a king, right? I want to say that the symbol here is a king or a kingdom. The head of gold. Because can a king be a king without a kingdom? Does it make sense? No. A king has to be ruling over something. So a king must have a kingdom. So it's safe to say that when I say he's the head of gold, I could be talking about Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar. That makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to give you guys an answer. I'm going to tell you guys a hint. I'm not going to make you fish for it. This statue right here is going to be a timeline, okay? And it starts off with who? King Nebuchadnezzar, who is the head of gold, and he is ruling over Babylon. Perfect, pa perfect. Okay, but is, is Babylon the world-renowned empire today that it once was? What was, what was Babylon taken over? Absolutely. Did Nebuchadnezzar think that he was going to be taken over? A absolutely not. You got to understand the vastness of Babylon, okay? In fact, when King Nebuchadnezzar was writing tablets, he often would, would romanticize about Babylon. In one tablet, he wrote, The whole earth falls prostrate at her feet. A second clay tablet, right after that one, found also in the same archaeological dig, is that the excellence of this kingdom, may she, being Babylon, last forever. He thought it could stand the test of time. And I know that if I'm delivering news to a king that can end my life in seconds, I want to end on a high note. I want to end off saying, you are this head of gold. Now y'all have a nice night. I'm going back to sleep. But unfortunately, that's not the way the Bible reads out, is it? No, verse 39 says, but, I hate that word. It means the exact opposite is about to happen. But, after you shall arise another kingdom, right? And it will be inferior. It'll be weaker than you. A sissy is going to beat you up and take your kingdom from you. That took confidence, I think. Now, if we ask our historians, what was the kingdom that successfully rose against Babylon? If we, if we looked at the history books, you know, there was hundreds of battles against Babylon, but none of them succeeded, none of them. And, and the reason being is because Babylon was a vast fortress, right? But if we ask our historians, who was it? They would say it was a Median and a Persian army. There was a unification between two armies that came against Babylon and they overtook it. It would make perfect logical sense. We have a statue, right? The head is of gold, the arms and chest. How many arms does a man have? Normally two, right? How many chests does a man have? One. How many heads does a man have? How many bellies does a man have? Uh, sometimes they have two. <laughs> but this one has one. How many legs does a man have? And we have two feet. How many toes? All right. 
So we know the anatomy of a human body, and we're going to use that same anatomy of a human body on this statue. So Medo-Persia, two arms, left and right. Now, I have a strong right arm and a weak left arm. It's just the way it rolls. I'm, I became dominant right-handed. I do everything with my right hand now. And so we had Persia, who is a stronger force, and Media, who is a weaker force. They come together, and, and they come against Babylon to wage war. And they were waging war outside the gates. But guess what Babylon was doing? Nothing. They don't have to do nothing. We're going to find out here real soon why. You see this city? Man, how it was impregnable. It should have lasted to today. It should have. You see, the, the walls were 200 feet high. This is 60 foot right here, I think. So imagine this times three and then another floor. That's how tall the walls were, okay? The gates that opened up, 150 feet tall. The walls were 20 feet wide. So this is about, oh, maybe five feet wide. 20 feet wide, enough for four chariots side by side to go rolling over the tops of the walls. They had the river Euphrates going through the city. They had no problem with water. They had no problem. They had irrigation. They can farm all day long. They had all the water they wanted. They had enough rations to last decades. The city was 15 miles wide by 15 miles. They had no lack of space. What was the problem? They would wait after Media and Persia, just like every army before, got exhausted. After their rations wore out, then, then Babylon would open up the gates and this army would come pouring out like a, a surge of ants and destroy, obliterate, anybody who challenged them. It was their tactic. They'd wait it out. They'd wait it out. Once you're starving and hungry, you're weak, you're tired, your fighting skill goes down. And so that's all they wanted to do. And Isaiah, oh, Isaiah is a wonderful book. If you get a chance, read it. Isaiah was written 8th century BC. When was it written? 8th century BC. Our story today is 6th century BC that we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar, just to keep it in, in check here. So 8th century BC, he discusses the Persian army 150 years before his presence. He reveals the precise details on how the event will occur. And by he, I'm talking about God, because Isaiah was a prophet. He wrote down what God told him to write down. The last thing is that he reveals God's plan for the reconstruction of Jerusalem. Why did Jerusalem need to be reconstructed? Because Babylon decimated it in chapter 1. Destroyed it. Obliv I mean, three attacks, no temple, no walls. There is nothing left of Jerusalem. But in the book of Isaiah, he gives these four details out. So, in Isaiah chapter 44, verses 24 to 28, says, Thus saith the Lord, pay close attention, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of the babblers. Now that's a really key term. Those who speak Babylonian are babblers. Okay, just so you guys know. And he drives who? Diviners mad. He turns wise men backward. He makes their knowledge foolishness. Now, when, when the king was asking for his dream and the interpretation, what could the, what could the wise men do? What could those Babylonians do? They, they could do nothing, right? It, it was as if their intelligence light was, was switched off. He goes on and says, and, and he goes, who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your what? Your rivers, pay attention. When I underline something, please pay attention to it. He goes on saying, who says to Cyrus, who is the leader of, of Persia, by the way, he is my shepherd and he shall perform all my pleasures. So he is writing out, what if your name was written in the Bible? What if your name, first and last, 
written in the Bible. How would you feel about that? You know, Cyrus is probably converted because they brought these scriptures to him and says, you are this man. And this was written 150 years before you were born. That would make me think. Would it make you think? We serve a God that knows the end from the beginning, right? From things of ancient times to things not yet done. He's saying it here. And he says, Cyrus, your pleasure for me is this, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Now, the reason why this is so epic is because he actually is the one. Through his kingdom and through his lineage, he gave the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the Persian Empire. So we got frustrate the wise men, done. Appointed his chosen Cyrus, done. Drying up the rivers and opening the gates. We're going to go there next. Okay? So Belshazzar threw a huge party. Huge. Absolutely massive. If you go to Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, Belshazzar was, was known as one of the most irresponsible kings. He actually has a really horrible reputation as I researched him. But Belshazzar, the king, had made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. How big was his party? It was pretty big. He drank wine in the presence of the thousands. And while they, he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and the silver vessels from his father Nebuchadnezzar, which he had taken from the temple, which he had seized in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords and his wives and all the concubines might drink from them. Was that their intended purpose? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. While they're having this massive party, while they're having this massive feast, while they're desecrating the, the, the relics from Jerusalem, Cyrus and Darius are outside the gates, warring against the wall that they can't break down. No one cared. Why worry? They can't get in. They'll be there tomorrow. They'll be there next week. Now, Belshazzar was thought to be a fictitious king. There was no record of Belshazzar in any of the history books until they unearthed this thing. It's called the Bonita Cylinder from Ur, the same place Abraham comes from in our Bible. And so this, 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 is, this is cuneiform writing on these cylinders. This, this is how they kept records. They'd make these cylinders and they would stack them in lines and above. And so this actually shows that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the father of Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar's father was, Belsh what was Nebuchadnezzar. So actually, Nebuchadnezzar had a grandson named Belshazzar, who we're reading about in chapter 5 of Daniel. Okay? So Cyrus had an idea. An idea came to his mind, a great idea. He's like, I am going to divert the river Euphrates. I'm going to dam it up and make it go into the wasteland. And when that happened, as the river started lowering and lowering and lowering, they found out that the two gates that were in the waterways between the city and outside the city were open. They were unlocked. And so the army marched through the dried riverbed. They pushed open those two gates. They walked right through. And the impregnable city of Babylon was overtaken in a single night. And only a handful of people died. They went straight to the capital. They, they killed Belshazzar, and, and that was it. The empire was no more. And we can find that in Daniel chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. Don't take my word for it. Please never do that. Verse 30 says, That very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received a kingdom, being about 62 years old. And now I know you're saying, but Mike... Michael, you, you told us that it was a Medo-Persian army. And that's understandable. I ain't lying to you. In Daniel chapter 6, take one page and flip it forward. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 28, it says here, So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. So Darius was the Mede. Cyrus was the Persian. Did God get it right? Absolutely. 150 years prior, he says, I'm going to dry the river, the gates will be open, and you'll overtake an impregnable city. 
Cyrus, you're going to do my pleasures, and you're also going to rebuild Jerusalem. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 2. We're almost done with our story here. So the head of the statue is representing King Nebuchadnezzar, his son and his grandson. After this, we find out that the empire ended in 539 B.C. So if you can imagine 539 B.C. right here, just up to the side. Now we have the start of the chest and arms of silver. The Persian army was probably the largest army ever recorded. As big as Babylon was, the Persian army could not be numbered. They did the same thing as Babylon did. They assimilated not the wise men, not the rulers. They assimilated the soldiers. They scared them and they took them in and they retrained them and they gave them Persian weapons and they gave them Persian uniforms. And if you wear a Persian uniform, if you wear a Persian weapon and you're with other Persians in an army, guess what? You're also Persian. And so they fought alongside the Medo-Persian. And they went across the world lighting it on fire. There was one army that refused to be assimilated to them. Refused. Too hard-headed. And if we ask our historians, if there was an a, 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 a empire after the Medo-Persian Empire, would they say yes? Absolutely. Today, Medo-Persia, we hardly even know what that means. That was a great empire back in its day, but today it makes no significance to us. It's no longer a world-dominating empire. And so they would say, absolutely. There is one that was able to do it. And Daniel chapter 2, verse 39, it says, But after you shall arise in their kingdom, and fear of yours, then another, a third kingdom of what? Bronze, which shall rule over the entire earth. Now, real fast, side note. We got another detail here. World-dominating empire, right? World-dominating empire, right? World-dominating... Do you see there's a, 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 um, a trend going on here? Each part of this statue is going to be dominating the world. It's not just any who's who kingdom. Because people have taken the statue and say, well, this is Mother Russia, this is Germany, this is France, and we're like, well, how did, how did you come up with that? Well, it makes, it makes perfect sense. And they use their own intellect, they use their own interpretation, but as for me, in my house, I use, I use something I'm certain on. And so far, they predicted that Babylon was going to be Babylon, and Medo-Persia was going to be Medo-Persia, and they told me how they were going to take over an impregnable city, and it happened. And it happened. So after Medo-Persia, there'll be a third kingdom. And they would say, yes, there was this, 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 this kingdom that it came after, and it was, it was a horrible fight. They came, they warred against them, and they fought back in numerous odds. In fact, there's a movie that shows a depiction of, a depiction of it. I, I watched it a long time ago, really bad movie, but it's called 300, and it's about these Spartans. Does anybody know where Spartans come from? Spartans come from Greece, right? They're from Sparta. Sparta is a Greek city. You got the Trojans, you got the Spartans, you got so many other Macedonians. But guess what? They were not organized. And, they, and, 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 and the Persian army thought they could just roll over this island, roll over these fishermen. But once they got there, they, they bit off a little more than they could chew. The, the Greeks were not going to, to succumb. Now, again, the historians say that. The historians say that. The movies, they say that. But what does the Bible have to say? That's, that's what I'm worried about. What does the Bible have to say about it? So the belly and thighs of bronze is most likely the Greek nation. In Daniel chapter 8, if we turn there, Daniel chapter 8, and we'll go to verse 20. Once again, Never take my word for it. Let's read it from the Bible. And this is a second vision that Daniel had. This is, this is a vision that he had personally, and it's expanding on this, this big old statue. We're going to go over this, this, this vision later on in the seminar. And he says in verse 20, The ram which you saw having two horns, they are what? The kings of Media and Persia. Labels it out. Every translation, whether it's in Hebrew or whether it's in English, it says 
Media, and Persia. Those two names are there. They've never been added in. And verse 21, and the male goat is the kingdom of what? This was written before Greece was probably ever formed. Again, they were just an island of fishermen. They might have had swords and sticks, but they weren't no great nation. They weren't independent. In fact, they didn't even have a king. They didn't even have a king. So we can see. Now, I want to go to verse 7. Chapter 8, turn back just a few verses. And this is the vision that he's had. I want you to see what the outcome of this battle was real fast. And here it says, And I saw him confronting the ram. So the goat is confronting the ram. And the goat moved with what? Rage against him, attacking the ram. And he broke the two horns, and there was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he cast him to the ground, and he trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. I want you to imagine this. How much strength did Greece have? Nobody could challenge them. Their, their art of war apparently came out of nowhere, but was superior to that of the Persian army. And they ran right over the Persian army through their tactics. It couldn't have been their numbers. It had to be their skill. Now, this is a mural. It's called the Battle of Issus, 315 BC. And we see two of the great kings here. I'm going to give you a little highlight. On, on, your, you see, on your left is the first king, Alexander the Great. On the right is Darius III, who was trying to defend the Persian empires. Now, Alexander was the first king. Does everybody know that? In fact, his name was Alexander the Great. And he conquered a known world in about a little less than 15 years. A decade and some change. And in fact, he was so good at it that he went through depression after the world was conquered. The Medo-Persian army ceased to exist after both Darius III and the Persian king were killed. And that was around 331 B.C. And afterward, the, the Greek nation gained control of the entire world. Now, I want you to read something real fast with me, and it's going to be a book that pops up here. It's from uh, Arena's History of Expedition of Alexander the Great, page 206, chapter 30. And he says, I am persuaded. I am persuaded that there was no nation, no city, nor people that in being where his name was not reaching or was not heard or was not spoken of. Alexander was probably one of the greatest kings and, and tacticians ever to rise, ever. Even better than any of our like, current tacticians. He continues on saying, There seems to me to be, have some kind of divine hand presiding both over his birth and his actions. The question for you is, is what was Greece a world-dominating empire? Well, Alexander the Great did a great job at it, right? But let's think about it. In our medical and our mathematical worlds, we have Greek vocabulary. It's all over the place. We can't get away from it. Um, the whole New Testament is actually written in Koine Greek. Um, let's see. What else can we say? Well, not too much else. Are they a world power today? They claimed bankruptcy last year, didn't they? The euro came out, and they claimed bankruptcy. Does a world power, a world-dominating empire, does it need to claim bankruptcy? It should have all the world's wealth. There's no way that Greece is currently a world-dominating empire. So who took over Greece? Who took over Greece? And so, Greece ended in 168 B.C., if you ask any historian, if you look up any history book, okay? And Alex, Alexander the Great killed himself, actually, through bad habits, through, through depression, through partying. He weeped because he said there was no one left to kill. This man was set on fire for war, and when there was no more war, he had no more purpose. And we had no more purpose, he kind of withered away. 
Now, after he died, they, they, they tried to find another king that could substitute him, but there was none found. And before that could happen, the next part of the statue happens, you get these long legs of iron. Now, real fast, before we go too far, I, I want to tell you a, a vacation I went on. What was it, last year? Year before last? I got to go to Jerusalem, right? Uh, I, I get to go traveling a lot. I love traveling. But I went to Qumran. Does anybody know where Qumran is? Okay, well, Qumran is a very special place. It's where the Essene nations, these Jewish priests were at. And, and they would spend all day, and they would copy the Old Testament, book by book, perfectly. If there was any flaw, if there was any issue in it, they would destroy the entire scroll. They wouldn't put a little line through it like we do. They wouldn't use some white out. They would just destroy the scroll. So these Essenes, these high priests from, Jews, from Jerusalem, I'm sorry, they, they, they lived out here in the Qumran area. They wrote all these scrolls, and then they would wrap them up and put them in the jars, and they would store them in the caves. Now, Qumran is by far the hottest place I've ever been to. Right next to it is the Dead Sea, and they got Death Valley. It's dead out there. There's no grass. And so when I was out there, that dry humidity made it perfect for keeping things preserved. I mean, there was not an ounce of moisture. If it rained, the rain would hit the ground and it would be gone. It's like the ground just struck up the water. And so I was out there, and I got to go to the Qumran Caves, and I got to see all the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they found every single book in the Old Testament there except for the Book of Esther. So if every book in the Old Testament is in there besides the Book of Esther, is Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Absolutely, absolutely. There's no question about it. They were discovered in 1940. They did their carbon dating on them, and that, these, these are just the copies of... Are these the originals? These are not... The, no, they were copying them for, for centuries. But these copies are, are found to be from the 3rd century B.C. to 1st century A.D. So... Right now, in our timeline, we're at 168 B.C., so this is far after some of these scrolls were written. If that makes sense, amen. Okay, what I'm saying is, from this point forward, what was written down by copies, what was written down by copies from the originals, the originals happened way before that. Do we understand that? So everything from this could not have been written in afterward. Like, hmm, I'm going to write a book that's going to predict the future, and I'm going to write it 10 years later. I'm going to pre predict the previous 10 years. Like, if I was going to be a wise man, I would say, let me write a, a, his a prophetic history book about the uh, World War II. And I'm going to say everything that's going to happen in World War II, but I'm writing it in 2018. Now, now that might be one way to make me look like a prophet, I, I, I'll put some dirt on it. I, I, I'll rub some rocks on it, and I'll, I'll put it in a vase and then throw it into a, a cave. And one day somebody's going to find it. Oh, wow, this man was a prophet. With accuracy, he stated. But no, these Essenes, carbon dated by our own scientists, secular scientists who do not believe in the Bible, dating these, says 3rd century B.C., 1st century A.D. And these are only the copies. These ain't the originals. So the originals happened beforehand. So everything from this point forward is not possibly going to be made up. It has to be predicted, and it has to be genuine. Does that make sense? Okay. So the long legs of iron. A man has two arms, right? How many legs do we have? Two legs. So this kingdom of iron must be two parts of a kingdom as well. It must be. We've got to follow suit. We're not going to make things up. If we go to Daniel 2, 2 verse 40, the Word of God says, And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush what? All the other kingdoms. All the others. So we have a world-dominating empire. So far, every previous world-dominating empire has lasted at least 200 years. So we're at, uh, what, 168 B.C., at 200 years. We're at 32 A.D., okay? We know that they use iron. 
We know that because it's called iron monarchy, right? And um, I got to ask, it's not deliberately written in the Old Testament, but in 32 AD, was there a, a kingdom around that was world dominating? Let me ask you a few questions. What kind of crucifix was Jesus nailed to? Okay. What kind of soldier pierced his side? What was the name of, uh, or the position of Pontius Pilate? What kind of, what kind of position was that? It was a Roman position, right? He, 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 was, he was a pontificate. He was a perfect. And it was a Roman position. Does it make sense? Was Roman classified as a world-dominating empire? All roads lead to what? When in Rome, do what the Romans do, right? Rome was the first empire to equip their soldiers with iron. And the iron ripped right through the brass shields of the Greeks. There was, there was no competition. They were just stronger and more. Their phalanx system crushed anybody that tried to come up against it. There was no hope for them. But I thought there was two nations. Rome is only one nation, right? The big city of Rome. Well, anybody know who Constantine is? Constantine was, was a unique king, unique. And he decided because of all the things that were going on, he wanted to relocate his capital from Rome in Italy to Constantinople, named after who? Constantine, Constantinople, yes. He's very selfish. That's beside the point. So he names the capital after himself because he feels he is the god of the entire world. And so he does that. Now, the capital of Rome still exists, but now Rome has been split into how many kingdoms? Eastern Roman Empire, Western Roman Empire. The two legs of iron. Now, later on, Constantinople got changed over to Istanbul. Istanbul is one of the most popular cities in Turkey today. But it's no longer Constantine. So, if we go to Edward Gibbons... He wrote The History and Decline of the Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 4, page 408, chapter 39. He writes, The images of gold, of silver, of brass that might serve to represent nations and their kings were successfully broken by what? The iron monarchy of Rome. Is there any way that this could be have correctly interpreted, that somebody could have guessed 500 years in the future. It's very difficult to, to believe, but I'm going to still say it's possible. I, I, it's possible to say that a, a world-dominating empire, a world-dominating empire, a world-dominating, and just keep on going in succession. It's, people might do that. That might work. Now, Rome was conquered by who? Who is the world-dominating empire today? And it's not America, I'll tell you that much right now. We're struggling, right? Rome did not get conquered. Actually, there was a, a, big, a big battle going on every which way, but nobody could take over Rome. Prophecy states in Daniel chapter 2, verse 41, very next verse. I know there's a lot being said between these verses, but I thank your patience. Verse 41 says, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the king shall be what? The kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as those toes were partly of clay and partly of iron, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile, weak, right? So how many toes do you have? Hopefully we have 10, some have 9, some have 11. I have 10. The statue has 10. And I think that Daniel was intending for 10 toes to be here in the, in the book, right? And so 10 kingdoms came out of Rome. And it came because there was this massive war that took, uh, that took place. It was the barbaric invasion. Uh, the, the, the Norse and all these, these, these Vikings and these people from the, the Northern Isles, they came down and they came up from the Moors, from the, from the south, and they started picking apart Rome. They started doing what? Picking them apart. Like Thanksgiving dinner, right? Now, they couldn't take over Rome. And in fact, even when they got in their places, Rome still assimilated them by their power. When it was in Jerusalem, 
Do you know that Jerusalem in the days of Jesus was underneath Roman rule, but it was trying to pull itself away from the control of Rome? Is that true or false? That's absolutely true. We'll find out here when we talk about the Gospels on, I think it's going to be next week. And so here we have these, these sections of, of barbaric invasions that establish themselves as new colonies separate themselves away from Rome. Now, in uh, the map above, we're going to see we have like the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, the Vandals, and uh, the Anglo-Saxons, all these different nations. If we look at the map today, it's actually called Europe. We have England, we have France, we have Portugal, we have, we have Italy, we have Germany, we have Switzerland. Now, three became extinct, which were the Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the, and the um, Heruli, or Vandals, I'm sorry. They, they, they were stomped out of existence uh, through the ages by Rome itself. But this was divided Rome. And so, question. If I was going to tell you, if I was going to say, I'm going to predict the future, A will take over B, B will take over C, C will take over D, and all happens in succession. All happens as I say. And it'll be easy for me to say that D takes over E and E takes over F, but that's not what's said here. It says, no, no, no. D will divide into 10 pieces. And all this happens, and it divides. Would you believe the next thing this person is telling you? Let me put it differently. If you go to your office, you go to a supermarket, you go somewhere where you're talking to one of your friends, and they say, you know what? I'm feeling today about you. You're going to meet somebody. They're going to have a red sweater, blue jeans, and a green cap, and they're going to buy your lunch for you. And you're like, ha, okay, thanks. And you go up, totally ignoring what they said, and then as you're going through your day, lunchtime comes, your stomach starts grumbling, and somebody comes alongside, and they have what? A red sweater, some blue jeans, and a, a green cap, and they say, you know what? I am just convicted to pay it for today. I'm buying your lunch. You would like, wait a second. Earlier today, I think, yeah, somebody, okay, so you go back to the person tomorrow, right? And they say, yeah, you know, I, I had a second feeling. I had a second feeling. I had a feeling that you're going to help somebody out with a car and they're going to make your life a whole lot easier. Like, uh, I don't see that happening. And you're, you're walking at home and all of a sudden some person breaks down right in front of your house and they're weeping and crying like, oh, mercy. And so you go like, how can I help you? Oh, my car is broken down. Can you help? I'll call, I'll call AAA for you. Oh, thanks. Call AAA. They come, they fix up the car, the car gets turned away. An hour later, they come back and they give you like a hundred dollar check. And you're like, wait a second. That next person, this person speaks to you. Are you going to start listening to the person now a little bit more? I, I will start listening to them. They're right two days in a row, third day. Again, fourth day. Again, with amazing accuracy. On the fifth day, they say, there's something that's going to change your life. If I had nothing important before, I'm going to say it now. This is the most important thing and the most convicted I've ever been about anything. Will you listen to the words they're about to say? If they've been right on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, and Saturday's coming around, they're like, this, this is a huge, it's absolutely going to happen. You've got to do it. Would you, would you believe them? Well, so far, 3rd century B.C., 1st century B.C., going through the A.D., all the way past the A.D. to our current day. God got it right so far. Would you say yes or no? He said there's going to be Babylon, there's Babylon. He said there's going to be Medo-Persia, there's Medo-Persia. Calling them by name. And the ruler was called 150 years before it, the, 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 the actual city ever existed. He says, one after another, it will happen, it will happen, it will happen. I am telling you the end from the beginning, because why? Why am I doing it? Is it so I can show you a cool trick? Is it so I look impressive to you? No, no, no. It says, so you will believe what? Believe what? He wants you to believe the rest of the things in this book. 
He says, I'm showing this little trick here with a man with a statue. I'm using just a person with a gold head, a silver body, a belly of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. But the big picture is there's much more in this book than just that one statue. And I want you to believe all of it because I wrote all of it. That's what he's trying to say. Amazing predictions, amazing predictions. Verse 43. And as the toes and the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdoms will be partly strong, partly fragile. Verse 43. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they, who's they? The divided nations. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere. What does that mean? They will not come together, right? They will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. There has been all kinds of of methods to try to reunite Europe, NATO, the Euro. Kings and queens have tried to intermarry their princes and princesses to try to form alliances. You had, you had acts of violence. You had Napoleon. You, you had Hitler. You had, you had everything they could throw at them, but nothing would unify Europe. Is Europe unified today? No, no, no. It's still, it's still separated. They still conflict. They each have their own kings. There's a king of Spain. There's a king of Italy. You have two kings of Italy, actually. Germany, Switzerland, they, are, they, don't, they, don't, sit, they don't have the same ruler. Each one's independent. They have the, their own constitution. They're not together. And God said they wouldn't be together. Was God right? Verse 44. And in the days of the kings, in what days? In the days of these kings, the last nation, the divided nation, and the days of Europe, I'm going to be very specific. In the days of Europe, the government will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into pieces to consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand how long? It shall stand. If he was right on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, will he be right on Saturday? He will be absolutely 100% correct. Nostradamus correct 10% of the time. He might got half of one of these rights. Might have. But God got every single one right. Here's the kingdoms once again laid out. The head of gold, chest of arms, silver, belly of bronze, leg, uh, legs of iron, feet, iron, and clay. Here's the nations they represent. We covered it all today. If we go to verse 45, and we're closing out here in a second. And as much as you saw the stone that was cut out of the mountain without man's hands, and that has broken to pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made to the king which will what? What will come to pass after this. And then he finishes with the most boldness I believe anybody can say. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. We live in a world of uncertainty. I ain't got to tell you that. You know it. You turn on the news. My, my sister lives in a very violent um, city near Chicago, Illinois. And I, I, I fear for her every day. Life in her city is even more uncertain. We, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We have no idea. We have no idea. So I'm choosing to start off by putting my faith in something I can call certain. If he was able to take his finger and put it in a timeline of Babylon and draw a line straight through with supreme accuracy, saying there was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Europe. And then he says, right after Europe, right after, it's going to be my kingdom. Where are we on this statue today, brothers and sisters, my friends? We are on the very toenails, well put. We're on the toenails. How much time do we have left before that rock that's carved out without man's hands hits that statue? I say to rock cast. I'm saying we're waiting for the impact. I'm not sure when it's going to be. But I know that God gives a, a great promise. I know that God gives a great promise. It says, and in those days, these kingdoms, uh, uh, the Europe, and these days of Europe, 
the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, never, ever be destroyed. And the kingdom shall be left to other people, and it shall, and it shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. My appeal is simple. In this uncertain world, where we have people trying to tell you the truth through crystal balls, horoscopes, astrology, fortune cookies from an Asian restaurant, can we rely on that? That is a, 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 a faith built on seeking. I offer you today, this is the first night, I offer you an intentional faith where I will put some sturdy concrete, a stone that you can rest upon, that your faith will be planted where it will not be shaken, where it will not be beaten down when the storms come. For I want my shaky faith when troubles come that I will falter, that I will flail, and that I will be found wanting. There is enough of that in the world. There is enough lies. There is enough deception. I'm, I'm done with it. I want truth. I want life. So I invite you tomorrow night. Tomorrow night we're going to be talking about signs. Forecast is the sky is falling. So if you're willing to come back tomorrow night, if you want to research more about an intentional faith, I'm going to ask that you just simply raise your right hand. Say, I, I, I would like to come back and learn some more. Now as we leave tonight, you're going to get a little handout. It's going to cover what we talked about tonight. It's in a little little pamphlet form. You can use your Bob. You can go through it. There's a quiz on the back. Now, there will be a quiz tomorrow. And like, well, I didn't sign up for no tests. It's okay. The test has some perks. I have a lot of gifts to give out. A lot of gifts. And so, I, I, I want to give you guys a review first. A what? A review. I'll tell you a secret. Okay? The review is tomorrow's test. So what is the purpose of Bible prophecy? That you might believe, that you might have faith. John chapter 14, verse 29. What are records that support the book of Daniel? A little bit difficult, right? Now, any one of these three will work tomorrow. But we got the scrolls, which were found in the date at 200 BC. We have Nebuchadnezzar's cylinder. We have the Nabonidus cylinder. I would say just remember Dead Sea Scrolls and you'll be safe. Each of the sections of the statue that we have right here, this man of iron, this man of clay, this man of bronze, man of, of silver, what is he representing? He's representing, yes, world dominating kingdoms, right? Daniel chapter 2, 31, 39 through 40. What does this, this kingdom right here, this, these legs of iron, what were they again? They were Rome. They were east of the Roman Empire. All right. Let's go and wrap up in a quick word of prayer. And then we're going to dismiss for some tasty food. Amen. Well, Lord, our Father, you have shown us that you truly do know the beginning to the end. The, the, the dating copies of the books that were copied by copies by copies alone are older than most of the prophecies that were revealed to us today. There is no way they could have been shams. There is no way they could have been forged. They're authentic. And it's not like we made up symbols and we say, this means that, or this means the other. You in your divine wisdom said, this will be Babylon, this will be Media, this will be Persia, and this will be Greece. You, you laid it out in, in, in plain language for any benefit of yourself, not to glorify or boost you up, but instead that we might just believe in the rest of the words that are surrounding Daniel chapter 2. So Lord, be with each person here today as we go forward. Encourage them to return. Next lessons, Lord, now that we know that the Bible has certainty behind it, we can be certain that as we use the Bible to interpret the Bible, that the, that the answer will be true and absolute. They'll be certain, and the interpretation will be sure. 
And so we ask this in your name's sake. Amen.